It's so much fun to be back here again with Michael. Michael and I have had many, many conversations in the past, but he's been busy with a new job and a wife and a baby, all of which you didn't have when I first met you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, it's a delight to have you here. And and recently I was talking to you about a new guy that I discovered named Kirk Durston, who is going to be on the channel in March. And he um, he has many degrees, but they have to do with... Um, information and and he's also done some stuff in biology with dna and and i ran across a clip of his that i just wanted to share real quick um, that i thought would give us a jumping off place to start here and uh, we'll just play a couple minutes of this he's such a cheerful guy whoops so you can see this right yeah information and DNA ceased to function after only one error was introduced. If we grant that the mind of God was behind the genetic information programmed into the DNA of life, then God designed that information to be copied over and over again and continue to work even in hostile environments where random errors were introduced. Here's my point. The information God programmed into our DNA was designed with maximum flexibility, taking into account real life challenges such that it could still accomplish its objective generation after generation and with thousands of random errors introduced into the software of life. Now let's compare that to the Bible. As I study genetics and specialize in the genetic information in genes, it struck me one day that God used the same approach when he inspired the writing of the Bible over a period of one and a half thousand years. It was designed with three things in mind. First, it was designed to be copied over and over again by humans who will make copying errors and still convey accurate information about God and his desires and plan for humanity. Second, it was designed with the kind of flexibility that would allow it to be translated into all human languages such that people of any language could read it in their own tongue and come to an accurate understanding of what God desired to communicate to us. Third, it was designed with something we call redundancy. And I need to explain what I mean. When a spacecraft is sent to another planet, backup systems are usually built in. In a hostile environment, a critically important component might fail. So one or two backup systems are designed into the spacecraft so that it can keep working millions of miles from Earth and for many years in some cases. The existence of backup systems is often referred to as redundancy. We also see this redundancy in genetic information. Humans, for example, have a minimum of two copies of each gene, so that if one is defective, chances are the other one can supply the required protein. We see brilliant redundancy in the Bible. Now, I know it would be great if when we wanted information about the Trinity or the end of human history or how to grow closer to God, we could simply turn to the one chapter in the Bible that dealt with that particular topic, the way we often design textbooks to work. But what would happen if a particular people group at some point in history didn't have access to that particular section of the Bible, as so often has been the case? One of the amazing things about the Bible is its built-in redundancy. Instead of having everything to do with one topic isolated to just one section, it is distributed throughout the Bible in such a way that one can still find accurate information about that topic, even if they do not have access to the entire Bible. Furthermore, the more important that information is, the more often it seems to be repeated at different locations throughout the Bible. To so we'll just stop there. I could listen for a long time. <laughs> but what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's obviously true. And you could sort of you could sort of say that uh, anything that's lasted through a long period of time has has these features in place. Um, you know, whether it's um, you know, great architecture, literature, et cetera, there, there's something at which um it's it's sort of operating at, at many different levels. Um, 
um, that I, I think even when we talk about or think about something like um, beauty, for instance, I, I think what 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 uh, we're able to perceive as beauty is this sort of all at onceness of of the many levels kind of interacting with uh, each other. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's it's um, it's a phenomenal insight, and I, I think it, uh, it it sort of throws a bit of a wrench into our sort of modern understandings of of mechanical causality, and this sort of like we have this sort of uh, over rigorous way of trying to search out um, how things should work uh, theoretically and and so forth. Um, but I don't think really jives with. Uh, the 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 book of nature as we see it yeah this morning i was as i was walking i was listening to uh some kind of scholar talking about heidegger's essay on the work of art and he was talking about a lot of different things in there as heidegger always does but one of the things that uh, this guy mentioned was that um when we hear a sound like for example, the wind whistling in the a storm whistling through the the chimney of the fireplace. We don't hear a bunch of um, particles moving that are pushing up against the air that is pushing up against our ear. That's not what we hear. We hear, oh, there's a storm causing a whistle mm -hmm. in my fireplace. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's exactly the thing that Jordan Peterson's always talking about when he says that meaning precedes matter. Um, so you were talking earlier about um, that things kind of have to get gathered together in order to appear or be revealed. And it's that gathering together that um, it's the meaning that gathers it together. So mm -hmm. without the meaning, there'd be no gathering together. Yeah, the and, the, um, the the unity that precedes it. Is, yeah, which which presupposes, uh, yeah, meaning and purpose prior to, um, prior to the this coming together. Well, and see, and this would be true of all the senses, right? So I mean, empirical science is supposed to be based on what you can sense, but you're not just sensing photons; you're sensing something comes together for you because of the consciousness that you have. Um, I think it would be, isn't that, wouldn't, be, wouldn't that be consciousness? I think that's what consciousness is, right? I mean, uh, yeah. So um, I ran across this word, this Greek word in the scriptures, sun, sunedon, made up of two words, sin and adon. And the adon is the, the kind of seeing that's perceiving like oh i see i see mm -hmm. you know I, I grasp that all of a sudden and then sin is like uh, sin a synthesis bringing together so the sunedon is the basically the the apprehending that comes when things gather together and uh, <clears throat> and i kind of think that that maybe was the greek word that was being used for what we think of today as consciousness because i know they didn't mm -hmm. They didn't have a word for consciousness back in the day, right? Right. And that made me think of Barfield. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That that um, you you consciousness is always this this gathering together of of things, um, and specifically for human consciousness, it's it's uh, it is this. Interpenetration of both, like the, the the so the earthly stuff, which goes down into all the the nitty gritty details, and then also um, the the sort of unseen elements that for us are really salient, right? Like, like as as again, because we are meaning seeking creatures, we we we're looking for that meaning first and foremost, and in fact, that's that that governs whether we see or perceive the thing at all to begin with because you know uh i've often heard um you know consciousness described as is really it's really this filtering mechanism which is uh, you, you have like just a, a if we looked at all the the stuff you could be perceiving at any given moment at any given time it's just it's you know uh, this infinite 
complexity and and yet somehow we don't experience that we things just appear to us as salient and important and where we focus our attention you know um and that that sort of happens naturally so the the salience comes from the 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 gathering is that i think i think it comes from um this i don't know it, like whatever it, it's i mean it's hard to discuss i think without getting quickly into ontology um and um i think that's where sort of modern presuppositions go wrong is that they have cut off that portion like that portion doesn't exist anything sort of unseen that doesn't can't be measured with you know um it, it just it in some sense doesn't exist um but where where is it where's it coming from i i think um to i think there is a fundamental love or care that is this this sort of basic substance of 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 reality that we that that allows us to exist at all and because that precedes us it uh, it brings purpose and meaning to to this uh to everything that occurs um and such where that we um such that we can we can sort of do this now it's obvious that we in some sense like you know there's this whole nature nurture thing where like we 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 practice certain modes of app perception that can really bent or twist us in ways that are better or worse right um so that you know uh especially like in in, in this area where we're there we have so many extra extraneous like cultural artifacts of like you know information like social media and so forth that like really can um I don't know, sort of grab a hold of our attention in, in, in interesting ways. But um yeah, I don't know um where I'm trying to go with that. But I, I think it, it is interesting. Like every everything you, you you either have this problem of infinite regress in terms of trying to understand this, or you have to assume some sort of basic ontology, I think, of love and and or you know, care or something like that that it, that undergirds everything. Yeah, I mean, um, when especially when you brought up the whole thing about ontology there, about anything unseen doesn't exist, what really popped into my mind was a couple of days ago, I decided to do a word study of the word idol in both the Old mm -hmm. Testament and the New Testament. And in the Old Testament, it's very, very interesting. There's like five, four or five different words that are translated idol. But one of them is this word, elil, E-L-I-L. And when you look at Elil, it means basically it, it comes from uh, another word, al, which is the adverb of negation. Mm. And Elil itself means insufficiency or worthlessness or nothingness. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as though nihilism itself is an idol. And uh, then there is a... Uh, The uh, and then of course the word it's very strange because the word icon in the New Testament is is how Christ is described, which is often translated image, but the actual as I, as near as I can tell the actual meaning is like likeness. Mm -hmm. It's not like an image that can be true or false, but it's it's a perfect likeness. So it would be like all of the character and attributes and you know everything that there is about god he's the he's the perfect likeness of god but it got me to thinking that there is some sort of a contrast well and then the other thing was that iniquity is also a word that means non-existence so iniquity we think of iniquity being like sin like being something you did wrong but iniquity is actually the word trans that that they translate it as iniquity, but the actual meaning behind it is non-existence or non-entity. 
And so there's something about this that when there is no love, there's no way to bring together. There's no meaning with which to bring things together so that they have entity or that they have existence. So it's all vanity, worthlessness, emptiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I do think that's um, sort of the fundamental experience of, of folks that are caught in, in nihilism is um, this, um, I think, well, I'll just speak from my own experience, but I think um, in periods of my life where that was, was kind of the prevailing mode, there was a sort of um, separateness to all your, your life where you had like sort of these se separate sort of boxes or categories of, you know, um, interactions like, you know, like, and there wasn't, there wasn't any sort of meaningful communication between those things, like to, to kind of pull them up into a, a whole. Um, and, and so there's this sort of fundamental arbitrariness to everything, you know, whether, whether you, you choose to, um, pretend that this, this little box has meaning or this one doesn't, but, um, it's a, it's, it's tremendously, um, I think cognitively, like it's, it's like you're kind of in, in an overload. Because you, you you have you sort of feel this need to to try and um, produce or or fabricate some sort of meaning full structure um, where where you um, have this built in sort of skepticism that it's that even that's even real so it's like you're you're kind of you're always sort of fighting yourself because you you at, at your at your most fundamental level desire uh meaning but you're you you don't believe that that's really a thing you know that or that if you do it's it's you you sort of um indulging in a sort of self-deluded kind and i think that partly happens because of taking apart um dividing separating like if i think of of durston's video and he's talking about the way <clears throat> that the Bible has all these connections all the way through it. So mm -hmm. earlier in the video, he, he said when he was a child, starting from the age of eight, he'd read the Bible every day, like 15 or 20 minutes every day, but he didn't have any sort of pattern. He'd just pick up a passage and read it. Mm -hmm. Still, over, the, over 10 years of reading every day, he got a pretty good picture of the wholeness of what the Bible is about, even though there were a lot of chapters he never read. And maybe even had been whole books he never read, but he still got pretty much the whole picture. Then when he was 18, he started reading through the Bible every year um, as a whole. And, and of course, then you get even more of the wholeness. But it is possible because the Bible has so many connections built into it and so much redundancy that it is possible even without reading the whole thing to get the basic picture but kind of what they do is systematic theology is that they make that book he was talking about where they separate everything out into this piece and that piece and make all these silos in the bible you know so and so then you end up with all these divisions of uh denominations because this division yeah. takes that particular piece of the system and they cling to that and another one takes this piece of the system but it's not meant to be all these little silos there's meant to be all these interconnections, which is the same way that our consciousness works yeah. with all these interconnections of ideas. And so when we hear a sound, it could be, there are a lot of different things it could be, but what pops into our mind is all these alternatives that are part of that connecting system. And then we figure out what it is. We don't figure out what it is based on the particles. And I think that's true even of any scientific endeavor. There has to be this synthesizing of, of our experience and our understanding and, and all of the categories that we inhabit in order to come to these conclusions. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And, um, you know, the, what I was referring to earlier in terms of, like, these sort of separations, it does... 
it does it does lead to that kind of negation that you were referring to in, in the underlying word structure there for for what 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 these idols end up doing um because um i mean i, I think the big difference between to an idol and icon is the idol is sort of something that you kind it, it's an end in itself so it, like it, it stops like you 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 treat the thing as as that's all there is rather than seeing what it what it's meant to illuminate behind it right so like um which again you mentioned you know christ is the likeness of god and that's that's really what he talks about in the gospels is um a sort of desire to um like his mission overall is to make the invisible visible in finite form you know to, to to represent the father you know in real space and time um and i think that's that's sort of the fundamental lens for understanding what he was doing uh while he was here and including what he does on the cross as well um is is uh it's a a finite representation of something that's infinite. Um, but yeah, so, but when we, we, we stop at the finite thing and can't and lose a sense of the connectedness or the, um, the lensing or the imaging of something larger and infinite and invisible, um, we, we, that's, that's when the icon becomes the idol. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, what you just said, like fireworks went off in my head when you mentioned that um, often when we think of Christ being the likeness of the Father, <clears throat> we think of observing his life and observing what he did and what he said in, you know, telling the parables and interacting with the, the apostles and with the people that he healed and but we don't very often think that that the cross itself, that his, his experience on the cross is also a likeness of what God is accomplishing through eternity. And uh, yeah, that's yeah, a finite representation of the infinite. That's that's very powerful, very powerful. Yeah. And it, it's, it's sort of the boat we're always in. Like there, there's a sense in which all of our endeavors are always a grasping. It's always, it's always a, a sort of a representation of the finite longing for the infinite. Um, but because we're so limited um, in, in, as creatures, we, we tend to sort of have these sort of artificial cutoff points where we can only fit so much into our um I don't know consciousness or whatever whatever the computational limits of, of what um, we have um available to us. And so we 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 create these sort of arbitrary bounds, especially and especially really smart people do this, I think, more than anything is and and we we feel this sense of having drawn the the perfect map of, of reality you know that we've we we now have the model that suffices you know um and um i mean i think historically that's it's just always wrong it doesn't matter um uh, you know how smart you are the, the smarter you are in a certain sense the more capacity you have to to pull yourself with these sorts of things um and to more to to wave off um and uh defend your model to the point where you can't um you can't really see what's in front of your nose you know i, I always think of somebody like like sam harris he always um he, he's obviously so intelligent but it's like you, you'll see him in certain conversations where um you know especially the ones with with peterson where he just clearly can't understand what's being said to him. Like, it's like, it's like, uh, he, he can't, he's just gotten so good at his own rhetorical defenses of, of his modes of thinking that he, uh, he's in a, in a, his own little prison of thought. 
And and I think it it ties into this idea of insufficiency because um, the map of reality. I was thinking about this the other day because I was listening to one of Ian McGilchrist's recent lectures, and he was um, kind of drawing a picture of the two hemispheres of the brain in a way that was a little bit different than he has in the past. And so this thought came into my mind. <clears throat> this is not what he said, but it's a thought that came into my mind, and I could easily be wrong. But the thought that came into my mind is that um, he that the left hemisphere is... Um, good at quantifying what has occurred in the past and creating a map with it. The right hemisphere is good at being aware of what is happening right now and intuiting what might happen in the future. Because mm -hmm. uh, the right hemisphere is the, the uh, kind of attention that can take in the yeah. environment to tell whether or not there are opportunities or whether or not there are um, dangers to be seen right so so that's the now and the what's to come but the left hemisphere is needs a map of what what has been solidified so far what is mm -hmm. what it has already occurred so that it can use that map to create things to manipulate and and you know it's very useful but you have to also have the right hemisphere's picture of the now because mm -hmm. the now is occurring and there are anomalies yep. that occur in the now that you have to be aware of. If you're not aware of the anomalies or of what might happen, then, then the map of reality is going to always be wrong. So yep. if you're satisfied with the map of reality, you are satisfied with that which is not sufficient. And um, you know, there's a verse in the Old Testament um, which I can't remember right now, but the basic idea of it is why do you eat, why do you buy bread that does not satisfy? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As you're, as you were saying that I, it, it made me think of, um, the longer, not, not the clip you shared of, um, what's the scientist's name again? I forgot. Durston. 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 Yeah. So you'd shared a longer clip where he, he talked about sort of his, how he, was listening to some geologists having an argumentation about like trying, they were out in the field looking at, you know, rock sediments and so forth and coming up to, you know, very all, you know, people that were PhDs and esteemed in the field and the subject and coming to radically different conclusions about what, what the physical evidence was showing them. Um, and he, he said that was kind of a tipping point for him realizing that, 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 that there are certain types of science that aren't, that are much more speculative uh, in terms of their motion so that they are uh, by their very nature tend to lean towards the abstract and the, the sort of like mental models and, and sort of all these kind of circular reasoning um, that, that doesn't have this sort of robustness of what we think of science in terms of like, um, you know, having very precise measurements of like, say, like if I drop this ball, we know that the mathematical model for like what, gravitational forces are going to exert on it and like we can we can do that over and over again we can get even you know you know more decimal places uh, precision over time in terms of how we do that which it's 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 just not the same and i i think when we're embodied in 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 real situations we always we, we we're always bumping up against reality in ways that is, is a constant like stick in your side reminding you that your mental model is insufficient and it, it pulls you into the now right like and, and this happens in little and small ways all the time and especially in social situations working with other you know you know interacting with other people like you you think you have this model of you know something you know really well like your your husband or your wife and you know uh then they do something that surprises you and you, you suddenly realize that you you have to update that model like, or that that model is not um is not the person because you can, especially if you're smarter, you can build a sort of sophisticated model, of, you know, your partner and think, you know, what's going on and then realize you don't. Um, but I, I do think that we do live in a time where we, we, we get into a lot of these um, more speculative abstract modes of, um, of perception where it's, you know, it's, 
it, 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 it just, it just really lends itself to this sort of prison of thought where there is no, there is no cashing out of a, of an embodied experiment or something where uh, the reality gets to, to poke its head in and say, Hey, you're wrong, you know, you're wrong. Um, um, and so I, I guess when I'm, I, I mean, I have this issue in my, in my day job as well all the time, because um, it, it's funny people, you, you get in situations, everybody to try and understand the complexities of digital technology. People also come up with all these sort of mental models to explain what's going on or, um, even trying to project in the future. Okay. We do things this way now, but this would make more sense into the future. And like, this will help solve customers problems by doing it this way. Um, I'm always looking in the back of my mind for like, okay, well, that sounds great. I, I love your story, but like, do we have an example of like somebody who's doing that at a very, you know, like a large customer that's actually deployed that and it works for them. Like, I, cause I, a lot of times I, I just, uh, you know, I need, I know the tendency of, of really smart people to like, you know, sell themselves on their own story. Um, and it's, it's entertaining and you have, you know, amazing PowerPoint slides, it, it sells good, you know, it, it, but the, the rubber meets the road when it's actually in operation and you're actually doing something with it, then, then you really, all the, uh, all the real life cost of, of doing the thing show up. Yeah, the real life cost. That's a very interesting thought. Um, so let me let me stretch us a little bit because that for some reason that makes me think of the whole issue of flexibility, which was one of the other things that came to my mind when I was listening to Durston talk. Is that um, having this redundancy built in? permits a lot of flexibility. It permits, um, well, one of the other examples he gave that was not in the clip was that when you build a piece of machinery that has to interact with the real world, like a Jeep that's gonna mm -hmm. go through the wilderness and through muddy valleys and through rivers and all of that kind of thing, you can't build it to perfect specification because if there's no leeway in the in the um in the specifications there's no room for these anomalies to happen so if it's too rigid the thing just falls apart the first time it hits a speck of dust so um that means that these flexibilities have to be built into a system in order to keep it functional when it's going through anomalies mm -hmm. and uh that makes me think about free will. That what that basically means is that free will is essential for the universe to function. And, and I think that free will has to probably go all the way down. Which that's that's a a, yeah, super interesting. So you're thinking there is that it's it's sort of a, a decentralization of of um yes that choice has to exist at every level for the system to survive because i mean just like the the story about the the federal uh was it you not ups but federal express is that fedex yeah the fedex guy that that uh, was confronted with a client that they had guaranteed that they would get the product at a certain time and and the roads were closed. And so he went out at cost of $75,000 and rented a helicopter to get this oh, wow. $50 package delivered. And instead of getting fired, he got, a, he got a raise because he looked outside the box and he found a solution to an anomaly because FedEx's guarantee was one of their important Principles mm -hmm. that, that they lived yep. on. Now, I it's probably a urban legend. I don't know, but it's a story that used to be told in a lot of leadership conferences on uh, on what it means to drive drive the responsibility and the accountability and the opportunity down to the lowest level. And and I think it, that there there's something about the way the universe works that there has to be choice 
at every level in order to manage anomaly because anomaly is always occurring somewhere. Yeah. Now, I know you have a hard stop coming up, so maybe we want to have a have another time in the future when we can talk about that issue of choice and flexibility and free will and determinism and all of that. Yeah, I would, I would love to. I, I think you you probably know that's that's kind of a hobby horse of mine, um, figuring out or thinking through um, how does how does that agency that free will interact with the uh, the agency and and will above us like in, in a hierarchical faction all the way up to the top and all the way to the bottom. So I yeah definitely an an interest specifically of mine. Well, I, I do think that what you said earlier about love has to be involved there. I don't know if you heard the conversation that um, I had on my channel with DC Schindler and Ian McGilchrist when the conclusion we came to is that everything arises out of love. And so love has to somehow be involved in that, that um, issue of free will and agency and where it occurs in, mm -hmm. in the organization or the system of the universe yeah i think yeah i think schindler argues pretty convincingly in his books that that love is a sort of fundamental component of ontologies it's 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 pretty compelling um well i was surprised that mcgill christ agreed with him because you now mcgill christ is not um well i think he i think he is a theist of some sort at this point mm -hmm. and over yeah. time his 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 thinking has been shifting but um but i don't know exactly what kind of theist um yeah. but the idea that he would recognize that that love has to be at the bottom of everything i thought was pretty interesting yeah yeah and and i you know if to bring barfield back in he he always said that at some point um, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able be able to do science anymore without making explicit reference to Christ. And I, I think what that is is again, at at some point we're going to have to have explicit reference to that relationship between the finite and the infinite. Um, we'll have to come back into our um, our perceptual awareness to make real progress do you could you point me to where that quote is um i have to look it up I, i've uh, i've got so many of his books in my head i i, I could uh, i could take a guess yeah I mean, I, i'd appreciate that because i would like to read that i would like to read that book whatever that is you know yeah. i mean the, the only one i've read well i read um saving the appearances but yeah but by the time I get to the end of it, I can't I can't understand <laughs> the beginning of it anymore. Yeah. I read Speaker's Meaning it's, and I have a pretty yeah. good grasp of the whole argument in Speaker's Meaning. So um yeah, that would be great. And if we can get together again sometime in the next month or so for another half hour, that would be terrific. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy work day. Yeah, no. absolutely. I, I would love to do that. And it's yeah. it's been great seeing you and chatting again. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you, Michael. Take care, Karen.